There's a lot to love about summer in Tassie. The long hot days are always a welcome antidote to the frosts and rains of the cooler seasons. But for the connoisseur of fresh fruit, December through to March are like manna from heaven. All over the state, farmers and pickers are harvesting hundreds of millions of dollars in fruit exports while the sun shines. On Fat Pig Farm, however, our plump, delicious chili whack raspberries are a tasty summer temptation that sometimes even struggle to find their way onto our summer dessert menu. I don't want to carry the basket. I'm supposed to be picking raspberries to take to the kitchen. <clears throat> Most of them don't make it. That was a good one. My name is Matthew Evans. After years as a big city food critic, I bought a farm in Tasmania to better understand what I eat by growing it myself. I built a restaurant right at the top of the farm, but now I want to get a better understanding of what I eat eats. This means starting from the ground up to improve the health of our soil, our farm, and our food for generations to come. From foodie, to farmer, to chef, to rehabilitator of the land. How hard can it be? Ever since we started the garden, I've been growing rose geranium. It's amazing, fragrant geranium. This is it here. It's sort of spindly, not a huge number of leaves. I don't know why it struggles so much. It used to get driven over a bit um, right on the corner. So I'll put that post in, but it's doing better than it was. Anyway, these are the leaves and Absolutely amazing fragrance. Like rose petals, but slightly different. Uh, rose geranium goes really well with berries. I might make a little rose geranium jelly um, to have with raspberries. Our raspberries will only be ripe for the next four to five weeks, so we have to harvest them daily. But somehow, I always find the first flush of summer fruit to be the most flavoursome. And I think Sadie may enjoy this little experiment. This is some boiling water. And what I want to do is I want to steep my rose geranium in there. And then um, the gelatine. It makes a really soft jelly. It's not a jelly you can put in a mould and tip out. It's more a jelly you dip into that melts. I'll whisk that straight away. Let's get my sugar in there. I've used caster sugar, it solves quicker. And I just need to cool that down. I was thinking about doing them as individuals. So I just want to do this as a trial. So. I'd love it to be able to see some raspberries floating in a jelly in here and maybe a little bit of um, flavoured cream on top. I need to strain all that stuff out. I'm going to put it through two sieves, coarse sieve to start with. And then, trusty tea strainer into my children's serving uh, glasses. Okay, I want to see if the raspberry float or sink. Yeah, they're going to float, so I might put a few in. Now, it's just a matter of about an hour in the freezer or longer in the fridge so the jelly can set. So, that's worked pretty well. I might just put a dollop of uh, cream on top. So it's sort of like a trifle without the uh, alcohol. And I've got these flowers from the rose geranium. It might look nice with a few little flowers on top. Very pretty. I actually smell the rose geranium coming off the petals as I peel them off. I made them for dessert, but say he's not here, I might have to eat mine now. I want to see what it's like. The jellies I like, the ones you, when you put them in your mouth, they just melt. No rubbery texture. Soon I'll eat hers too. Summer on Fat Pig Farm is undoubtedly the start of our season of surplus in the garden. The soil temperatures are warm and perfect for growing. But for me, it's also a time of reflection. Because this year, we've been trying to adopt a regenerative approach to how we farm our land by rebuilding our topsoil, improving our water cycles and developing the farm's ecosystem by increasing our biodiversity. 
But there's more to the idea of regenerative farming than just how you handle your crops. So, all this talk about you know, regenerative agriculture and looking after the land, and that's all very well, but we also need to think about the animals that we put on the farm. Oh, so I'm off to see a mate, uh, a good mate, who knows a lot more about this sort of stuff than I do. Back when I lived and worked in the city, 4.30 in the morning would have been an awkward time to be calling in on a friend. But these days, my old mate Nick Haddo... Morning. ..one of Tassie's most passionate cheesemakers, is a very early riser. Oh, they're freckles, I think. Hey. I think they're freckles. <laughs> Yeah, don't try and rub them off. I haven't seen as much of Nick as I like since we opened our restaurant on Fat Pig Farm. And in that time, he's been building a dairy farm that works in a very different way to most of our dairy industry. This is efficient as a, uh, you know, your, your big black and white cows? I oh, don't, not really. These are older breeds and, and that have been bred for other traits other than quantity. In the height of our season, we get somewhere sort of 30, 32, 35 litres per cow per day. Per cow. That's Which still is a lot. still a lot. Yeah. And that's actually more than what we expected. There are over 1.6 million dairy cows in Australia, and the bulk of them have been genetically bred for a single purpose, producing the maximum amount of milk physically possible, up to 50 litres a day. But Nick has decided to only use old-fashioned breeds, like these brown Swiss and Australian shorthorns. They do produce less milk, but unlike most dairy cows, can also be sold for their beef. Primarily, they are traditional cheese-making breeds. They're also dual-purpose breeds, so that means that the, cow, the calves that they throw off, we can raise as, as beef animals, um, which, again, is, is a, a significant point of difference between this farm and most commercial dairy farms. Yeah. Um, and flavour and character of the milk. Oh, flavour? You, you wouldn't know, care about that. What from sort of a cheese-making point of view, that's kind of... <laughs> that's what it's about, isn't it? So that's not a bad morning work, Evo. That's about... I don't know, maybe a bit less than a 1,000 litres. Holy hell. There's the girls. It's like 50 shades of brown. Huh? <laughs> I know. They're pretty amazing, aren't they? They're beautiful cows. Yeah, they're really lovely. They're very gentle. I love working with them. The telling bit will be the milk. Can we have a try? Of course you can. As long as you don't mind drinking straight out of your bottle. <laughs> sure we don't. So, the first thing I go is a bit... It's a bit wider than our Guernsey milk. Do you think so? Yeah. yeah. It's, oh, that's really golden. And yet the butter fat content on this milk would probably be higher. What's the percent? 6.9. But it's got a really long... Even though it's chilled, which means you get slightly less character. Yeah. Um, it's got that really long, lingering um, flavour. Is that, is that from the high fat or is that the flavour of the milk? I think it's from the high fat. Butter fat, in this instance, carries flavour. You know, fat's a great vehicle for flavour. So the more fat, the more flavour you've got. To be fair, Nick's not producing milk for drinking. It's purely intended for his cheese making. But what's fascinating about what he's built here is that by doing two things at once, his farm effectively uses half as many resources to produce twice as much food. The one thing we don't see here um, is the babies, I guess. So to have milk every year, a dairy cow has to <laughs> give birth. Yeah, of course. Um, and, and is there any difference there? Because a lot of those uh, boy dairy cows are killed quite young. All of our calves, we raise them in order to kind of produce beef. They're all on that paddock over there on the other side of the river. On the river. other side there, yeah. Yeah, and I mean, that is significantly different to the industrial dairy industry where, unfortunately, calves are seen as a loss-making exercise and therefore they got rid of virtually at birth. But it's not a problem necessarily that the farm or the farmer has created. We as a society don't value veal. Right? Which means the farmer can't get a, a decent return on it. So if we don't eat veal, the farmer can't make any money out of it so they don't look after the calf. That's right. So us as meat-eating members of society, you know, we, we've got some choice and some, some roles to play in this as well. Right. But to me, the problem with the dairy industry globally is that we've, we've created this system that the only way you can make money in it, because the margins are so fine, 
is by getting really huge. Yeah. So the question is, can we find a way to make dual purpose cattle breeds work on a larger scale as a way of producing our milk and beef more holistically? Well, Nick's certainly having a crack, but he's the first to admit that as a cheesemaker, he's only posing the question. But we have the luxury of being able to make those choices because we're not actually part of the dairy industry. All of our milk goes to our cheese. We're not selling milk into that, into that big commodity market. So you're not a normal dairy farmer because you're not selling milk, you're making the cheese. That's right. You know, this is all about cheese. You know, you see cows in the paddock, I see cheese. Farmers love good ideas because making a living in farming is, to put it mildly, hard yakka. But in the 21st century, there is a massive and widening gulf between farming ideas that produce good food and ideas that produce good profits. So I was really inspired to see what my mate Nick was doing with his dairy farm to create high quality milk and beef simultaneously. It was really interesting what Nick was saying about how you can run a commercial dairy using dual purpose breeds. So cows that produce lots of milk, but they also produce you know, animals with really good meat as well. So I'm off to see a bloke up north and, and he's got chickens and the chickens are dual purpose so that they produce really good meat, but also lots of eggs. And I'm wondering how I can use those ideas on our farm. The average Aussie now eats 245 eggs a year. But for every egg-laying hen born into our egg industry, a male chick is born who can't lay eggs, so it's disposed of at birth. So when I heard retired scientist Dr Gil Stokes up in Quamby Brook had been breeding his own kind of dual-purpose chooks, I had to meet him. Hello, G'day. Matthew. Nice to meet welcome, you, Gil. Welcome to Quamby Chooks. Thanks for having me. This is such an amazing garden. Look at this. Well, thank you. Wow. Just look very this. special. I yeah. know. You found paradise. Yeah, it is like paradise, and what a privilege. I can't hear a single chook, though. I can't hear a rooster. Oh, we better go down and have a look at them. I can't even smell With many them. Tasmanians now wanting to keep their own chooks for quality meat and eggs, Gil used his background in bioscience and animal nutrition to create a new breed of bird. For the last seven years, he's been carefully crossing meatier American heritage roosters with old English and Dutch egg-laying breeds. The result are these little beauties, the Quamby chicken, a dual-purpose bird that lays well and eats well. My market is small holdings like yours and backyarders, yep. and these people want big eggs, they don't want... Yeah, they don't, they you don't, don't want too many little, little annoying ones, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm also interested in live weight gain, but when you're selecting for both egg laying and, and size, you know, growth rate, uh, progress is a lot slower. Yeah. yeah. Modern day chickens are all descendants of Southeast Asian jungle fowl. Jungle fowl hens only lay about 12 eggs per year, but thousands of years of selective breeding has resulted in commercial chicken breeds that can lay almost 300 eggs per year. So the energy a hen gets from its diet has a big effect on how often she can lay her eggs. And Gill's Quamby girls are fed on the trendiest of organic chicken trail mixes. Crushed oats, kelp meal and crushed corn, bloody turmeric and even fermented milk. These are like hipster chickens, they're getting turmeric, kefir. You don't give them quinoa? <laughs> they're not proper hipsters then, they're not getting quinoa. What is it now, amaranth? I don't know. They can lay long and well, so long as they're well fed. The idea is to get a bird that has decent body mass so you can eat the roosters. Yep. rather than yes. whatever it is, 16 million roosters that die every year in Australia to, so we can have eggs. Yeah. But also get a bird that is actually laying a decent number of yes. eggs yes. a year. My plan is to take a few live quambies back to the farm and start using their eggs in the restaurant straight away. That's a great crate. But Gil's keen for me to try some at dinner tonight. Come on in. Because thanks to their breeding, they apparently taste the way chickens did before they started to be mass produced. Wow, look at the this colour. Is, this is half a bird, and there's vastly more flavour. And you can see the breast meat is quite red. Yeah, really the, good colour. The, a completely different bird from what people are now used to. But I was reading that the modern chicken is, you know, 20, 30, 40 per cent lower in protein yes. than the than the birds we were yes. eating 100 years ago, and and obviously protein gives it flavour. You can take a couple of those home with you and you can try them out. I'd love to try it. 
English boy. Come on, Jocks. Now, it's about a three hour drive home from Gill's place up north, down to Fat Pig Farm. There we go. And once I got home, the Quamby girls are already living up to their reputation. She laid an egg on the way. Well, they're good layers. Three eggs, three chooks, while they're on the road. That uh, beautiful looking chicken from Gill. I thought I might confit it, so salt it, and then slow cook it underneath uh, fat with garlic and sage. So, get some salt. Got a lovely yellow fat there. Salt's going to change the structure of the protein, change the meat. But if I put a weight on it, it'll speed up the curing process. So I'll pop this on here and then weigh it down um, and come back in a couple of hours, see how it looks. So I'll check it out. So it's looking good. Bit of sage, just throwing in whole leaves. Um, they're going to flavour the oil, the, the fat that I'm cooking this in. You want the fat to have a, a good flavour, but not overwhelm the chicken. So duck fat, beautiful. We just happen to have pork fat. Garlic. The fresher you can get it, the more fresh fragrance it has. So they can go in just like that. All right, so I just need my pork fat. So I don't want it, you know, I'm not going to tip it over so the chicken starts frying, but I just want it to be melted before it goes on. Oh, you can actually smell the sage just by that little bit of warmth in the fat. Beautiful. OK, it doesn't have to be fully covered, but close to covered, ideally. You're really poaching in oil or fat when you make this kind of dish. Okay, a little bit of baking paper and some foil and into a low oven. Two hours at least. The longer, the slower, the better. Oh yeah. Yeah, lovely and tender. And all that fat should still be really good for roasting potatoes and using for other things. I might just take this leg and thigh off and see what the breast meat looks like underneath. That fell apart beautifully. Ooh, yeah, look at that. See, that's not the, a normal bought chicken. It's got much deeper colour, sort of a yellowy colour. I'll try it straight away. Mm. That's an old fashioned chicken. That's the way chicken you know, probably tasted in my grandparents' era. And I can't wait to try that thigh. That's going to be the meat that falls apart. It's been a big year in the life of Fat Pig Farm because for the last 10 months, we've been exploring new ways to regenerate the health of our soil while still growing healthy food. Like these broad beans. Last year, we planted our first crop of corn, but corn absorbs large amounts of nitrogen from the soil. So this year, we've replanted broad beans because they're great at giving that nitrogen back to the topsoil. The experiment is clearly working. We have tons of broad beans now, which means I'm going to need a whole heap of new interesting recipes to use in the kitchen. So I've invited one of our neighbours in to show me a cherished family bean recipe. We're going to head up the broad bean patches up here. Sadie Farrah has run our local supermarket in Signet for over 30 years, so she's a bit of a local legend in our town. She immigrated from rural Lebanon to Tassie in 1981, and if there is one dish that helped her with her homesickness, it was a traditional Lebanese broad bean salad she learned from her mother, Ful Akhtar Bazait. How many are we going to need? Does it How keep? How you want to eat? <laughs> Besides broad beans, the other key fresh ingredient for what we're making is lashings of baby garlic from the garden, ground up in the mortar and pestle, stalks and all. Do you want me to pound that? Yep, don't be scared. I'm not scared. I'm not scared of the garlic. Yeah, sure. So am I trying to make okay. a paste or am I trying to just bruise uh, it? Just to make it bruise it, yes. Just to bruise it. What do you reckon, is that done? Yes. Yep, yep. good. That's that. Broad beans, or fava beans, have been part of Middle Eastern diets since at least the 4th century BC. Wherever you can get them. The tradition of having to shell the beans before cooking them began in European kitchens. But back in Lebanon, Sadie's mother and grandmother believed that by removing the skin from young beans, 
you lose a lot of the beans' earthy flavours. Yes. Oh, look at Lady Beetle. Because I've seen, you know, a few broad bean dishes, but no, nothing with, like, the, the pod and everything still in it. No, we do cook them with the pod when they're young. Yeah. And when they chaff, just eat it, uh, just the pod. That's that. Yeah. This one by itself. And just mm -hmm. bite it. Straight just out. like that. I can't do that. <laughs> Easy. This kind of dish is going to be a perfect fit for Fat Pig Kitchen because its simplicity lets the freshness and flavour of the beans speak for themselves. I've never just boiled the whole thing. That's the best thing about it. Yeah, just boil it. After a good boiling in salted water, Sadie believes in going big on the olive oil. Don't be scared. That's I keep going. It. Really? To this day, every time Sadie returns to Lebanon, her mother saves the season's first broad beans and freezes them so that they can make it together once she returns. Great. I, oh, I forgot forks. You don't need a fork. You don't? No. And best of all, once you've folded the fresh garlic dressing through the broad beans with some Lebanese bread, you'll save on the washing up. It's very nice. It's so good. With our broad beans having flourished in place of last year's corn crops and returned healthy amounts of nitrogen to our soil, we'll use the same method again once we've harvested another nitrogen-hungry crop, wheat. Six months ago, agronomist Andrew Cook and I planted our first crop of wheat so I could bake our own fat pig farm bread. So how many tonnes am I going to get out of this? Tons? No, <laughs> no tons. <laughs> yeah, maybe 12 kilos per row. Which well, will be enough to make a bit of flour. Well, Andrew's back and it's high summer. So it's time to see if we can, literally, reap what we've sown. The whole place is a bit drier than last time you were here. Yeah, no, I think it's a grain a fair bit too. I can see some wheat there. <laughs> what do you mean some? <laughs> I can see row after row. <laughs> you reckon it's ready? There's a way to test it and just break a head off and give it a scrunch. Like washing your hands. And the seeds will just fall out. So that means it's good. Yep. yep. So just pull them off? Yep. You'll probably just try and pick the ones that oh, look right. like they're from the dry stems. Oh, okay. So the good thing about a hand harvest, you can actually do multiple harvests. You can pick the, the ripe stuff and then exactly. come back. Yeah, you can come back later. Exactly. For every kilogram of wheat grain we harvest, I'll end up with about 450 grams of our own flour. But while I may not qualify as a wheat baron with this crop, harvesting it by hand has kept the world fed for many a summer. But we've been doing agriculture, as we'd recognise it, for 10,000 years or so. Yep. And only for about 100 years we've had tractors. Exactly, yeah. So for most of that time, this is what people did. That's right. Yeah, well, everyone had their little plot. They were very small farms back in the day. Yeah. So if you do harvest more of this, the best time to do it's in the afternoon. And the reason for it is, see these little spiky bits that come off the yep. grain there? They're called awns. And when it's a dewy morning, the moisture gets on that, sucks the moisture in, goes back into the head there. Yep. It'll make it a bit doughy. So and won't go through the mill. That's right. How much have you got? I mean, there's a bit of weight in there. I reckon I'm, yeah, if you've got about the same as me, it should be enough to do a yeah, load. Yeah. Only I reckon about 500 so. grams. Yep. All right. We'll start with that, see how it goes, and yeah, have the rest good. in the afternoon. The work that has gone into producing our very first harvest of wheat has been anything but mechanised. But there's no school like the old school. So to complete our afternoon's efforts, Andrew's got another ancient wheat tradition to show me, winnowing the grain from the chaff. So all we're going to do is basically take our two bowls, lift one up, keep one down low. I'll hold that for you. Yeah, you can hold that one if you like. Yeah. This nice breeze is going to blow that all the way for us. Yeah, right. Some of that bigger stuff you pick out by hand. Yeah, there's not a single seed gone that way. No, nah, that's right. Yeah, that's good. Let's have a go. Yeah, absolutely. It's no exaggeration that this simple technique and humanity's ability to mill, store, cultivate and trade grain marked the beginnings of human civilization and agriculture. Oh, look at that. Well, there you go. There's the first 12 grams done. That, that's it. No, it shouldn't be too many days at all before you'll have the uh, flour. <laughs> Not a bad effort for a humble little seed. That's good. So, I think it's only fitting that our very first loaf of Fat Pig Farm bread crowns that 10,000-year-old saga. How much of this flour did you grow, thresh, grind, make? This is the first loaf. This was 700 grams. 
This is $200 to, to um, produce this loaf. Wow. <laughs>